In the days when America was still a wild, uncharted country of forests and plains and canyons, when the great trails of discovery were still to be opened into the mysteries of the West, almost all of the people, the farmers and merchants, were gathered in tiny villages not very far from the ports where the Dutch and English sea captains had docked their mighty sailing ships. It was in one of these villages, at the foot of the haunted Catskill Mountains, that there lived a quiet, peaceful man who wore a funny stovepipe hat with a buckle on the front. The buckle didn't do anything, of course, but the man liked it there, and he always kept it shiny and polished. He was called Rip Van Winkle. It was a name his mother chose for him because just after he was born, she heard the cry of a strange mountain bird with silver feathers, part crow and part rooster. And the sound it made was very light. So, Rip Van Winkle, it remained. And when he married, his wife was called Dame Van Winkle, after the custom of the time. And his son and daughter were called Rip Van Winkle Jr. and Katrina Van Winkle. Even his dog Wolf was called Wolf Van Winkle and would not answer unless summoned by his full and proper name. Come on now, old Wolf Van Winkle. Let's see how many rabbits you can scare out of the woods today. Or maybe squirrels would suit you better. Or would you just as soon come fishing and sit in the shade? I know a pretty good tree for that. But Rip's wife was not the kind of woman who could let her husband slip out of the house for a day's fun. For miles around, you'd hear her squeaky voice as she complained of the work that needed doing instead. She'd stamp around her poor husband in circles, shaking a bony finger at him, her face getting all red and puffy because she always wore starched ruffled collars that were too tight. Now, just where do you think you're going off to, Mr. Van Winkle? You and that nasty, smelly dog of yours? Smelly? As if there wasn't enough work to do around the house without wasting precious time. Fences to mend, Fences. roofs to fix, chimneys to clean, Chimney. wood to gather. Why, the whole dreadful place is absolutely falling oh. to pieces. And the farm. Winter's farm. coming, you know. Can't dilly-dally around all day long. The barn needs painting. Hay barn. needs stacking. Corn hey. needs storing. Geese need fattening. Geese. There's bundles of work to be done, Mr. Van Winkle. Work, work, work. Oh. Oh, nothing. You think all I have to do is hop around picking up after you. Pick, pick, pick. And wash dishes and slave over a hot stove. Where, where are you going? Come back here, I said. Come back this very instant. Back, back, back. Ooh. If the day were cool and crisp, Rip would be off into the woods for a quiet afternoon of hunting. And if the day were warm and sunny, he'd wander to the river on the far side of town with his homemade fishing pole over his shoulder and Wolf prancing along at his side, carrying their lunch basket in his jaws, the way he'd been trained to. Along the way, they would be met by the children of the village who loved them both, and the children would skip and dance behind them, clapping their hands, singing songs, and trying to walk like Rip, who had a funny way of bouncing when he was out of the house and happy, almost as if there were springs under his shoes, his funny stovepipe hat sliding over on his nose if he bounced too much. Hey, tell us a story, Rip. Oh, yeah, tell us a story, a ghost story, please, with witches and goblins. And fairies and spooks. And Henry Hudson's sailor man. Oh, Rip, take us fishing, too. We'll catch catfish and trout. And stay late. And build a fire. And all get scared. Please, Rip. All right, all right, come along, then. But you have to promise to be quiet when Wolf Van Winkle here perks up his ears. Yeah. 
because that means he smells a catfish, and we wouldn't want to scare any away. <laughs> oh, goody. Goody. goody! Let's hurry! While on the long wooden bench outside the tavern, across the street, Nicholas Vedder and Derek Van Brummel would watch the procession go by. <laughs> Good day, Van Winkle. Such a way he has with the children. Have you noticed, Derek, how the dogs never bark at him? And how he teaches the youngsters to fly kites and play marbles and tells them tales of the Indians? Why, all the wives in the village have a kind word for him. All the wives but his own, old Nicholas. Morning, noon, and night, you can hear her tongue wagging at his tired ears, telling him how idle and careless he grows, that he's the ruin of the family. And yet he never hesitates to help a neighbor. It was just last month he helped me build my stone wall, you know. And he milked my cows when I was ill. And harvested bomb Dutch's barley. It's only true to say he is always ready to attend anyone's work but his own. <laughs> well, we cannot blame him with that red-faced badger of a wife at home. Oh, no, he can't. Where? 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 But even though Rip could be said to avoid all kinds of profitable labor, no one could say he was not a patient man. For after the children had had their fill of stories and tales of ghosts and Indians, Rip would sit on the grass by the riverbank with his long, heavy rod in his hands and fish all day without so much as a murmur, even if he never got a single nibble. Sometimes he'd doze off peacefully, only to be awakened by his dog, Wolf, poking at him with a wet nose, ears perked up as a catfish swam around the bobbing hook. Yet, more often than not, Rip had forgotten to put on the bait and the fish would swim off free, with Rip smiling a lazy and contented smile after him. Oh, well, there's another one gone, old dog. Seems as though we do a lot of fishing and never catch any fish. Never mind, though. It's been a pleasant day without anyone yelling at us. And when we get back, I have the feeling it'll be too dark to work. Not that it would do much good anyhow. Why, that farm of ours, Wolf, is the stubbornest piece of ground in the whole country. The fences fall down on their own. The cows go off into Brom Dutch's fields. Rabbits get into the cabbage patch. Weeds grow thicker in the wheat than anywhere else. And it always seems to rain, doesn't it? Just when we're ready to get busy outdoors. It's just not worth the trouble the way I see it. And if it's not worth the trouble, we might just as well spend the time where it's peaceful and quiet. Ah! I see you there under that tree, you worthless good for nothing. Oh. And you didn't so much as catch one fish for dinner? Oh, I suppose we'll be starving in the poorhouse if you have anything to do with it. All right, home we go. Up, up, up. At home, he combed the burrs out of Wolf's hair and whittled a new end on his fishing pole and told more stories to his own children, Rip Jr. and Katrina, who were as wild and ragged as if they belonged to nobody. Rip Jr. in particular showed every sign of growing up just like his father. And if he were asked, And what are you going to do when you grow up, son? He'd think a moment, looking out the window, and answer... Ah, uh, nothing much, I guess. One day, in the fall, when the wind was starting to blow a bit more from the north and the leaves were finally dropping from the trees after changing color to red and orange and yellow, Rip 
was caught by his wife oiling his flintlock rifle and polishing the buckle on his hat. Is that all you can think of doing when the storm windows need to be put up? Pottering around with hats and hunting things? You'll be the death of us all, Mr. Van Winkle, if you don't get busy, busy, busy. Do you hear me? Now, where are you going? Come back here. Get back to this house. Rip just yawned and picked up his things and made his way over to the King George Tavern, named after the King of England, to whom all the colonies and even the village still belonged. There was a picture of the king painted on a sign outside the tavern, a man with a red coat and scepter and white wig. On the long bench, under the sign, Nicholas Vedder was telling a story for the benefit of Derek van Brummel and the other men of the village, even though they had heard it many times before. All of them were smoking their favorite pipes and drinking mugs of ale. And I've heard it said... Rip joined them year, quietly. The ghost of Henry Hudson and his crew sails up the Hudson River, the very river which he first discovered and which bears his name. They sail in the ghost of their ship, the Half Moon, until they come to a lagoon where they drop anchor. Their mascot, a strange bird that's part crow, part rooster, lets them know when they've found a place. Where is this lagoon? Ah, <laughs> that's what no one knows. But some say it's not very far from here, and that once they've anchored, they make their way into one of the hollows of the Catskills, each of them carrying a keg of their cargo, a kind of honey and ale, with the magic of the sea aged into it. And that they play games of nine pins with huge wooden balls while celebrating their first voyage. <laughs> we wouldn't mind a little of that honey and ale now, would we? <laughs> Uh-oh, I think I hear a new kind of wind blowing. <laughs> yeah. Gotta be off and away to your hunting rib before you're caught. So Rip jumped up from the table, moving faster than any of the men had ever seen him move in their lives, and he skipped away through the village, motioning all the children to be quiet so his trail would be harder to discover. He continued with Wolf running at his heels until he was climbing the autumn hills at the foot of the Catskill Mountains. He climbed higher and higher until he was away from the hills themselves, and then still higher into the mountains, thinking that this time he'd be sure to have a little peace from the railing voice of his wife. Wolf barked happily beside him, and Rip noticed, for the first time, that the bark was echoing in the high mountains all around him, and down into the ravines and dark hollows. Hello? Now that's peculiar. I don't remember any place that echoed in these mountains before. I must have come further than I thought. It can't be very long before evening, either, when the sun goes down. Nonetheless, he kept on, not hunting at all, but just looking at the soft purple mists that moved over the tops of the mountains, settling over them like capes in the last of the day. He finally came to the edge of a high cliff, and from it, he could see the great Hudson River moving slowly in the distant valley, flowing its way to the sea. Here. What's that way down there in the mist? Why, it looks like one of those ancient sailing ships. I wish it wasn't so far away I could see better. Wait. The sails are furled around the big masts. It must be at anchor. No, now, now there seems to be nothing at all. Awfully peculiar. The wind was growing stronger as well, and beginning to howl in his ears as the long shadows of the pine trees crept over the mountain sides, and he was about to turn back from the cliff and go home the way he'd come, when he heard a strange voice calling. He 
He looked at Wolf curiously, who looked back at him, and together they looked all around them. But they could only see a peculiar bird that looked part crow, part rooster, flying down into a somber hollow. This is all getting mighty strange, Wolf. Who ever heard of a bird that called your name? And where's all that thunder coming from? There's not a single cloud in the sky. Hush up, Wolf. Quiet now, there's nobody else up in these... Oh! Looking around suddenly, Rip saw a little man who had not been there at all the minute before coming over the top of the mountain, carrying a keg on his shoulder. The man was only four feet tall and had a wooden leg and a gray beard. He was wearing a striped stocking cap, red and blue, and a sailor shirt, and strange leather pants, and wooden shoes. The little man seemed to be struggling under the weight of the keg, and he sang a funny song. Hello there! That keg looks heavy. Do you need some help? The strange little man didn't answer. He didn't even look up. He just continued struggling under the weight of the heavy keg and sang to himself. But Rip Van Winkle was hardly the kind of person to let another man, even a stranger, go without help. If it had been his own keg, he would have put it down and forgotten all about it. But seeing it belonged to someone else... You know, you can't carry that big thing down the hollow wall by yourself. Let me give you a hand with it. Uh, there, that's better. And when I get tired, you can spell me a little. All right? Again, the little man didn't answer. He just hobbled off on his tiny wooden leg, singing his song, and Rip followed him. Even though it was getting darker, and he didn't particularly like the looks of the deep woods they were getting into. Still, when Rip was tired, the stranger took the keg, and when the stranger was tired, Rip took the keg. And after what seemed to be a very long time, they crossed between two little waterfalls into a large open clearing. The sound of thunder was almost deafening.